I'm not going to be too long. This is just an incredible gathering of people and a true testimony, testimony to the vibrancy of the Chinese American community. I happen to be the father of two, to two Chinese Americans, considering my wife is Chinese, so they are hyphenated children. Um, uh, and so we're all in this together very much. Um, I wanted to talk just for a few minutes about the U.S.-China relations today. Um, and to take you back actually to 1843 when the first American president wrote a letter to the Qing court in which he stated that the United States really believed and hoped for a strong and stable China. And this idea that Americans have wanted to see China strong and stable is actually been part of the American DNA for many, 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 many decades, in fact, centuries now. But the interesting thing is today, now that China is strong uh, and hopefully stable, uh, Americans don't really know how to deal with it. And so uh, the United States really um, is getting what it wished for in its, in its dealings with China, but it doesn't really quite know what to do now that China is strong. And I think that is one of the issues underlying the current tension in the relationship. That China's economy within five to 10 years is gonna surpass the American economy. That China's Navy and military is now not as big, of course, as the United States' military, but as a regional military is probably equal to challenge, able to challenge the United States' military. And on Chinese technology fronts, for example, just in terms of 5G, the China's rollout of the 5G system, telecommunication system, is actually being done faster than it is in the United States. Not to mention China's high-speed rail. Uh, there's a great statistic since 1997, California has built 260 miles of high-speed rail, whereas during the same period of time, China's built over 10,000, 20,000 kilometers. So there's no comparison. It took the New York City uh, 10 years and more than $10 million to build seven stops on the subway in that same period. And with that amount of money, China has built subways across its country, Nanjing, Chengdu, Chongqing, Beijing, of course, Shanghai, etc. So um, at the same time, we're at a crossroads in the relations between the two countries. And for decades, Americans and the American government in engaging with China had an assumption that Chinese system would slowly converge with the system of the United States. And over the last decade, that convergence is not happening. And that forms another kind of foundation of the current uh, very difficult period we're in uh, between the United States and China. Is that Americans had, uh, in Washington, and politicians had assumed that as the relation, as China developed and as America developed, we would come closer and closer together. But the two nations are not. And so Washington is really in a crisis about how to deal with China. And that also underlies some of the current uh, issues in the, in, in the United States, States relations with China as well. Um, so I was a uh, member of the team that put together the Hoover Report on PRC influence operations in the United States. Um, since it's coming out, we've had a very great uh, dialogue with all sorts of stakeholders. And one of the things that I want to stress here is that we are open to rewriting sections, changing factual problems, um, changing how we've written certain sections, because we understand that the only way that our country can actually pursue a better relationship with China is with the help of all the stakeholders, whether they be business, whether they be politicians, lawyers, whether they be academics, people in think tanks, and of course, even and perhaps most importantly, people in the Chinese, the greater Chinese American community. And I have an interest very directly into this, as I said in the beginning, is that I'm the father of two Chinese Americans. And I don't want them, for example, to go to school should there be a problem in the South China Sea, like you mentioned, and have them be insulted because of their Chinese ethnicity, their ethnic background as well. So I'm open to, I'd like to take some questions if people are interested in, in dialoguing with me. Sir, in the back. Uh, I, got, I, got, I got one. Hello. Okay. Okay. I just uh, thank you. Thank you for coming over and explain to you. I did uh, participate in a Stanford sponsor uh, about the event, yeah. and unfortunately, I was unable to participate on the Thursday. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Uh, thank you for saying that you're going to revise the Hoover Institute report because to me, 
as a Chinese American, 52 years living in America, I find out the report. The certain things in the report are not are incorrect, using a lot of assumptions. I'll give you one example. When you refer Chinese American, when you refer Chinese in your report, we are in here Chinese American. So should, there should be a distinguish between what you're pointing to the uh, Chinese American or China or Chinese or whatever you do. That, that distinction has to be. Otherwise, when you single out an, uh, uh, an ethnic like a Chinese American in their report, uh, I also talked to Mr. Diamond, who is one of the author in there. Yeah. I asked him, okay, and he, he commented and said that if, if, if China is a democracy country as U.S. said today, he would, he would never write that report, okay? That is giving me a couple things, saying that, okay, he's biased on it, because he himself is a, is a pro-democracy. Then I follow up with the question to him, is that, since World War II, how many countries that we, as a United States citizens, support our government to turn into the democracy country? Since World War II, I cannot find one of them. The closest that I can find was the country that my, my wife came from, Philippines. But the Philippines was the number one tiger. Okay, let me make a comment because you brought up, I didn't know that you were coming in here, but this, this is a very, very uh, important to me. Okay, I'm happy to hear that you're going to revise the report because when you revise the report, you need to incorporate our feeling, a Chinese American feeling. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I completely take your point on the issue of the, the distinction that needs to be made in the report, and we will make it between Chinese Americans and the activities of the Chinese government. That's a completely um, legitimate thing. We've taken that to heart. In fact, we are going to rename the report because of input such as yours. So thank you very thank much. You. Thank okay, you. next. I really appreciate it, and uh, Hoover Institution would like to rewrite the book, but I really believe the Hoover Institution owe us apology. Thank you. I, I mean, I, I think that the fact that the Hoover Institution is going to be revising the book is, is an example of how we're, the people on the committee are sensitive to the concerns of the community. So we're doing the best we can. So, so my question is, do you think the U.S. would rejoin TPP? If so, what would the impact be for um, Sino-America relations? That's a great question. In fact, probably the dumbest thing that President Trump did was this, something, one of the dumbest things he's done. You never really can tell, right? It's a, but, but, but withdrawing the United States from the TPP was a huge failure uh, and a large mistake, and I cannot imagine that we're not going to get back into it. The interesting thing with the TPP is that when we pulled out, everyone thought it was going to collapse, but it didn't. Thanks to the leadership actually of Japan and Australia, it's continued, and now there's TPP-11. And I think that the only way for America to have constructive trading relations, not just with China, but with all the countries of Asia, is for us to get back into TPP. Would that be bad for China? I think that it will be actually good for China. Um, well, because TPP was constructed not as a, a trading block that was going to exclude China. It was, it was a trading block that would welcome China in if China could meet the standards of the TPP. And Obama, in his last last part of last year in office, tried to sell it as sort of an anti-China group. But the reality was, it was always written so that China could come in. And in fact, Chinese reformers liked the idea of the TPP because it would be a way for them to push reform in China by saying, "Here's this big trading block we could get into if we can reform our economy in that in a market-oriented direction." So I think it provides an opportunity to America for America, but also an opportunity for China. I don't think it's bad for China. There's okay. another question. Okay. Just a real quick question. Yeah. So what drove um, Hoover Institute to come up with this report, and why now? Well, um, what drove them, I think, is the, the understanding that as China has risen, its influence around the globe has risen as well, and that it is using a variety of tactics, some completely normal, like any major country, like Israel, like Saudi Arabia, like the Emirates, like the Europeans, and it's, and it's using other tactics which are not so normal to increase its influence. And I think getting a, getting a, trying to map that 
and understand that is the first step towards a deeper understanding of how China is going to be a part of all of our lives. And I think Hoover, but it's not just Hoover, the Asia Society was also involved in this project as well, including individual you know, representatives of academia and journalism who participated. And I think the timing just has to do with the fact that significantly, as to his point, um, there are some people who feel that China's direction right now is a direction that is causing a lot of people a lot of unease. Um, the increasing aggressiveness in the South China Sea, uh, heightened crackdown on political dissent in China, um, the export of Chinese political systems to other places, the rendition of Chinese dissidents from Hong Kong, from Thailand, back from China, and a variety of these type of behaviors, including the Uyghur situation up in, in Xinjiang, have caused people unease, and so um, I think that was part of the, the background to the report as well. Too. Uh, last question. Okay. Oh, okay. Our former mayor, of course. From Hoover Station, uh, from Hoover uh, Institute point of view, what Taiwan's position with this U.S. and China relationship? So I can't speak. I'm not a member of the, of the Hoover Institution, so I really can't. Okay, all right. Then from your book, from your study, what what do you see? So. Taiwan is in an interesting position. Especially, so, especially since November 24th election, how you see it? Right, so the November 24th election, you, you see the DPP losing uh, a series of... My sense is that if the KMT can field a legitimate candidate, the KMT is in a very strong position, potentially a very strong position, but who knows? I mean, it's, it's, it's early days, right? There's elections about well, less than a year away, but still there's lots of time. Um, but that said, Taiwan is really caught now in between, and, and actually Taiwan is potentially the biggest potential loser of really bad relations between the United States and China. So, partially because of the economics, so that, that Taiwan is so deeply involved in the semiconductor industry that if the United States begins to try to move the supply chain out of China into other countries, Taiwan's companies are going to be faced with a really difficult choice of how do they continue to engage in China and make a lot of profit, but how do they also keep the Americans happy as well? And, and it's, it's, it, that's a very difficult position to be in. I think that on the surface, the Trump administration talks a good game with Taiwan. We want to support our friends, we want to support our friends. But if you continue to do that, the, the downside of that is you're going to irritate Beijing so much that Beijing will make life very difficult for Taiwan. And so it's a, you know, as, as the Chinese say, it's very Wei Miao. Right now, between, between, uh, yeah. John, you have uh, any closing remarks? No, I just want to thank you very much, and and I, I will. Haipei has my contacts, and if you want to get my contacts from Haipei, if you have issues about the report, things that you don't like, specific language that you're uncomfortable with, or facts that you that you that you want to push back on, please be in touch with us. This is a living, breathing document. It's not, of course, as important as the U.S. Constitution. But the, the, the only way it will succeed is, is, is if it has resonance in your community as well as the other stakeholders as well. So thank you, and thank you for your comments. Thank you, John. Thank you so much for your time and coming here with a broken knee. Uh, yeah. uh, I have thank to you. say that I, I just spread some rumors, not from China, Chinese college days. Uh, now, here, uh, John has uh, had this last uh, latest book. Uh, a bestseller called